Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. So we are beginning upon this 30-day church challenge. Now, this 30-day church challenge is designed that for five weeks we're going to talk about the purposes of church and why we should be here. Now, some of us, uh, Kathy and I joke, because Kathy, by the way, takes attendance back there. You can't take the school administrator out of her. She takes attendance, and uh, we, we keep track, and we notice something in our church. We have... The A group, the B group, and the C group. Now, the A group, they're here no matter what, unless it's snowing. Unless it's snowing, but they are here no matter what. The B group, they're here about two Sundays a month, and the C group, they're here the other two Sundays a month. And then we have the D group, and you know who you are. We see you about three times a year, so welcome back, if that's you. Uh, but we notice that there's these groupings, and you know, as a pastor, uh, people come to me with all kinds of their, all their issues and all their problems, and I wish that there was some sort of magic wand, and I know what you want is that you want some sort of pill that I can give you, a little pill of Jesus, that you can swallow that pill of Jesus, and then instantly your life would turn out better. Uh, uh, unfortunately, or actually, fortunately, the Christian life is about effort on our part. Now, it's effort based upon the strength that God has given us. God has given us the grace. God has given us the strength. It is our job to use what he has given us to be better. God desires for us to be better. He desires for us not to keep living the same lives and doing the same thing over and over and over again. Any of you feel like you're on that hamster wheel? You just keep going over and over doing the same thing. That is not the life that Jesus Christ died for us to have. And one of the precious gifts that he gave to us was the church, is the church. Now, one of the things that we've talked about, the church is not an institution, the church is not a building, but the church is the body of the followers of Jesus Christ coming together. Now, notice I don't say Christians, because as you know, I don't like that word because it has become neutered by the people that want to say that they're Christians, but their lives don't look anything like Jesus. Now, I, now to give you some credit, my life doesn't look very much like Jesus most of the time, amen? But one thing that I'm trying to do is progress and cooperate with the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus. And you know what that means is that there are going to be things that I'm going to have to do that I don't want to do. Anybody there? You know, all these things I read in here, I don't want to do it, but they are actually for my benefit. See, God's Word is for my benefit, not for His benefit. Like, God doesn't need me to act any better because God is not 
uh, inhibited in any way by my dysfunction. And that's good news for you, okay? Um, and so likewise, God is not inhibited by your dysfunction. God has given us his word, he's given us his church, he's given us his spirit, and he's given us his son so that we could be better, that we could have a new life, the life that God had planned for us all along. So this 30-day church challenge over the next five weeks, I want to challenge you to make up your mind that you are going to come to church for the next five weeks. Now, as a bonus gift for each and every one of you, we're giving you a toaster oven today. <laughs> Just kidding. But we're giving you a devotional today to read over the next five weeks, the 30-day church challenge that you'll read over six days. Now, these devotionals are designed, Don, that you can read on the toilet. They are that quick. You can get your Jesus and do it all at one point. There you go. See, we are all about utility here. I'm always thinking about how I can help you be more regular. Okay, now, yes, I just said that from the pulpit. Okay, the scripture passage that we're going to look at for the next couple weeks are from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. This is what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Everybody say amen. amen. This is a description of the early church, the first church. Notice that it has nothing to do with denominational creeds. It has nothing to do with sitting in pews. It has everything to do with fellowship. It has everything to do with worship. It has everything to do with growing and growing the body of believers because there was something about the body of believers that attracted the non-believers. There was something that they wanted. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are our lives reflecting that to the point that the non-believers, which are everywhere, they want what we have? But many times what we have is the Christian brand of the world, right? We stamp the Christian label on it, but it looks very much like the world. We treat each other like the world treats. We talk about each other like the world talks about each other. We do the same things that the world does. You know, it's interesting. Now tonight is the Super Bowl, and I'm not putting down football. So please, I'm not putting down, though I don't care about it, but I'm not putting down football. But this is what I want you to understand. There's going to be lots of us tonight that are again doing the same thing that the world is doing, being entertained by the same things that the world is being entertained with. And we wonder why we have lost our prophetic edge in the society and why nobody wants what we have. Because what it appears to me what we have is religion rather than an active relationship which totally transforms our lives, which transforms our priorities. But most of the time, our priorities, again, are aligned with the world's priorities. And again, the world's priorities, this is the illusion, the world's priorities aren't bad. Because that's not how, the, how, we, would get, how we would get off course. How we get off course is good. Good is the enemy of great. See, the world tells you you've got to be a good parent, you got to be good husband, good wife. You got to be good at all, good at your job. Good, good, good. How many of us are tired of being good? I'm tired of trying to be good because I just can't be good. There's nothing in me about good. But God doesn't desire for me to be good. God desires for me to be great. Great in the kingdom, great in the eyes of his kingdom. And so what happens is we allow ourselves to get diverted off the course which God wants us to be on, and we end up following through what everybody else is doing. So today, let's look at community. Now, we don't like community, but the five purposes of the church, as we see within this passage, are one, to cultivate authentic community, which is what we're going to talk about today. 
The second thing is to experience worship as a daily part of your lifestyle. That is, God calls us to be worshipers, not just something that we do on Sunday, but it's an attitude how we live out our lives. The third thing is to take successive steps of spiritual growth. We see that the apostles and the believers, they gathered with one another and they were growing. They were doing something different. By the way, if you haven't been growing by doing the same thing that you've been doing, you might want to stop the same thing that you've been doing. Amen? Amen. Thinking that somehow, if I just keep doing it over and over, it will work out and it doesn't. Fourth thing is the practice, personal stewardship. That is, whatever we have been given, we've been given it as a gift. We are blessed to be a blessing with one another. Some of the most stingy people I've ever met are the Christians. Okay? And let me tell you something. When you go out today to go out to eat, and you go and eat at the restaurant, you better be a good tipper. Be a good tipper. Because you know what? Those waiters and waitresses, they talk to me, and they all complain about the church people. They say the church people are stingy. Now, what I see within the New Testament, the church people give, give, and give. So don't be stingy or I'll be coming after you. And you don't want to see this first thing in the morning. All right, that's why we start church at 11. Gives you time to deal with it. And the fifth thing is to reach out to the world around us. Now, why on earth do we need one another? A lot of people tell me that they don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And you know what? That is true. That's true, but it's one part of the equation. You don't need to go to church to be a believer and a follower of Jesus, but if you are a believer and follower of Jesus, you will go to church. So it's the chicken or the egg type of thing. And why will you go to church? Not because it's fun and not because the pastor is extremely good looking, which all the above are true for you. You are just blessed with that. But or the pastor has a good sense of humor and very charming and witty, but you go to church because God calls us to be together. And we, my friends, we have to start learning to obey God, not because it appeals to what we want, but because God has said it and that's it, okay? Now, so a lot of people, we don't like community, and we're going to talk about why we don't like community, because I've heard it from you, and I've said it myself, that I don't like community. I think there, there was a quote that I heard somewhere that um, I like humanity, but it's a human race I'm not fond of. You know, I like people, and I like the concept of community, but when we come together, uh, we seem to just get on each other's nerves, okay? How many of you get annoyed with people in your own household? There you go. Everybody's like, yes, that's me. Uh, okay. Because uh, you might be here with somebody in there. Now, Genesis 2.18, this is oftentimes what we apply to the marriage uh, stuff. But Genesis 2.18 says, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. So he made a helper suitable for him. My friends, the same applies to us, whether you're married or single or whatever. It is not good for us to be alone, to be isolated, to think that we're an island, because here's what ends up happening. One, we get ideas. Anybody there? And those ideas seem pretty good to ourselves, and then they're pretty lousy when we reflect upon them with other people. Sometimes we have to reflect upon other people. We've got to bounce it off of one another. But God, what's the goal here is that the partner is a helper, that we all need help. We all need help carrying the load in our life. Now, the Bible gives us some indication of what this Christian community does for us. In Ecclesiastes 4, we're told that if one falls down, someone can pick you up. If you're cold, someone can be there to keep you warm. All those different things. And we, right, we read that during uh, wedding times too. And, uh, you know, which kind of makes me gag a little bit because then I have to do the, you know, it's tough being a single pastor doing the marriages all the time. It's like, love, love, love. Okay, anyway. Uh, just telling you how I feel. Okay, so it provides support for one another. We need one another. We all can't do it alone. And that's the thing. We think that we can do it alone, and how successful are we doing it by ourselves? We're not very successful, and we fool ourselves into doing this. Like, um, uh, oh... Debbie, I'm going to tell a story because it just popped in my head. 
I'm going to tell the story and you'll have to forgive me. But here's the story. Um, Debbie and I, we were good Weight Watcher buddies. All right, and we went to Weight Watchers for a, a good number of time there. And, but what we would do is we would stop going to the meetings. We would just go get weighed in. And then we would go to friendlies and pig out. Okay? <laughs> Amen. All right. So that's what we do. And I know that's what a lot of people do. They get weighed in and then they go pig out. But we didn't even stay for the meeting because they were telling us all this phony stuff about, you know, well, you got to anchor yourself and this and picture yourself skinny. And I go, I can't even picture myself as I am. So, uh, all that stuff. So then what we ended up doing was we said, we don't need Weight Watchers because all we're doing is we're handing them money. So we'll weigh each other for free. It didn't work out all that well. Okay? It just didn't work out all that well. Why? Because we needed that accountability. We needed one another, and we fooled ourselves into thinking, hey, it was just about the 10 bucks. And don't you fool yourself into thinking, oh, it's just about the offering plate, what's being passed around here and all that stuff. There's more to community than that. So we need help. The other thing is, oh, and this is the other one, provides opportunities to grow. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. Now, here's the thing. We get on each other's nerves. We all do. And you all get on my nerves, okay? We get on each other's nerves. But here's the thing. Be, becoming like Jesus, I've told you this before, I am very much like Jesus when I first wake up in the morning. When I'm laying in bed, I am holy. I am in tune with the Lord. The birds are outside singing. The hills are alive with the sound of music when I wake up in the morning. And then I run into somebody. And then I want to run them over when I run into somebody, right? right. It's easy to, in concept to be a Christian, right? In concept, these things are easily applied. But actually, the only way that we ever get to grow is by taking the Word of God and applying it. And we have to apply it in difficult circumstances with difficult people. And my friends, that is why God has brought us together. Have you ever looked at the 12 disciples and looked at the people that Jesus brought together? These would not be the people that I would bring together. One, they couldn't stand one another. They had different agendas. I know we can't relate to the fact that we all have different agendas. They had different views of God. They had different interpretations, different vocations. Jesus called this band of misfits together and made them apostles. He made them the start of the church. It was the misfits that Jesus Christ came to use. And my friends, we are the island of misfit toys. Amen? Okay, God wants to use us and has a place in the kingdom. And what he does is, as iron sharpens iron, he gives us opportunities to forgive one another. He gives us opportunities to show grace to one another, to love one another, to accept one another just as Christ has accepted us. And so those opportunities, it's an opportunity to grow. The very thing that we run away from many times, and by the way, you might be one of these people, the church hopping people. About a third of a congregation will church hop within the course of a five-year period. A third of the congregation will overturn uh, in a five-year period. And why do we church hop? Because somebody said something to us. Somebody got on my nerves. I had a couple one time come here, and they said, well, we're coming here because our pastor made me angry. And I said, well, if you think he's made you angry, wait till you meet me. So here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to come back to this church. I want you to go back to your home church, reconcile with that pastor, and forgive because that's what Jesus wants you to do. I think I made them mad, and they never came back here. Don't know if they ever went back there. But I am sure that I'm going to tick you off at one point in time or the other, okay? But those times that we tick one another off and everybody gets on our nerves, those are opportunities to grow. Those are opportunities to be, take what Jesus says and actually apply it. See, you can't apply it when times are wonderful, right? You know, forgive. It's easy to talk about forgiveness when everything's going peachy in our lives, right? It's a lot harder to talk about forgiveness when someone's in the process of slapping you with their words or physically, okay? I haven't had that happen yet, but don't try it. I'll slap you back. Okay, now, I am a work in progress. 
So the third thing is it provides communal opportunities for worship. It's interesting that Jesus says in Matthew 18, where two are, or more are gathered, there the Father is as well. Now, God is everywhere at any point in time. He never leaves his children. But when two or more are gathered in his name, something special happens. God loves it when his people get together and worship him. And so we are called to worship him together. And ultimately, by the way, this will help with those other points because worship means I allow and I make God God in my life. Right? Because what ends up happening is don't we worship different things in our life? We all worship different things. We worship television. We worship family. We may even worship church. We love church. Some people love church. I don't get it, but some people really love church. Okay? And you might have been worshiping church all these years and never been worshiping Jesus. That's very possible. And so we have to come together in a spirit of unity. And interesting, when we see the word community, it's unity. We come together in one purpose, recognizing God is God and we are not. Amen? And the fourth thing is to show the unity of the faith. Psalm 133 one says, How good and pleasant is it when the brothers of the faith come together, and we'll say sisters of the faith, when the children of God come together and we can be unified. Now, we know that unifying uh, is a nice concept, but difficult in practice, isn't it, church? It's difficult for us to come together in unity and to be one. But again, we're able to come in together in unity when we recognize that Jesus is the head of the church and we serve but one leader. And me, thank you, Mom. And me, myself, and I are not the leader. We're not the leader of our own lives, and we're not the leader of the church's life. There's one person that we seek to glorify. And my friends, a lot of things would be uh, solved in our relationship problems if we recognize that Jesus is truly Lord and Savior of our lives. Now, I have a movie clip that I'm going to show you in a moment. Which oh, excuse me, can I get a refill, please? Coming right up. Excuse me. Are you, are you all right? Yeah. No. It's a long story. Well, I like stories. I'm considered a bit of a storyteller myself. My husband? Have you heard of New York's Noah? <laughs> the guy who's building the ark. That's him. I love that story. Noah in the ark. You know, a lot of people miss the point of that story. They think it's about God's wrath and anger. They love it when God gets angry. What is the story about then, the Ark? Well, I think it's a love story about believing in each other. You know, the animals showed up in pairs. They stood by each other, side by side, just like Noah and his family. Everybody entered the Ark side by side. But my husband says God told him to do it. What do you do with that? Sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If they prayed for courage, does God give them courage? Or does he give them opportunity to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be close, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? <gasps> well, I gotta run. A lot of people to serve. Enjoy. All right, so you might have recognized this clip from the movie, Evan Almighty, one of my favorite movies there. And, and Evan is a, a congressman who God tells him to build an ark, and obviously uh, building an ark in modern day times, uh, people thought he was just as crazy as Noah was. And so the family goes and leaves him because he's becoming quite nutty. Now, or as they see that he's becoming quite nutty. Now, what we see within in this movie clip are several things. Now, Morgan Friedman is playing God uh, in this movie clip. One, we see that Noah's Ark is a love story. You know, I like that idea that it's a love story and that the animals came two by two. They stuck together going into the ark. My friends, so 
so too we, we have that opportunity to stick together in that process of dealing with adversity together. And the next thing which is very important is the fact that those difficulties, which we see as difficulties, how many of you have problems and you see them as problems? And the rest of you, do you have a pulse? Check. Okay. But these are difficulties. We say they're difficulties. We say that they're problems, but really they're opportunities. They're opportunities for us to grow, opportunities for us to become more like Jesus. And isn't that what we truly desire? Isn't that why you're here? I hope that's why you're here. Now, what makes Christian community difficult? One word, people. Okay, uh, Luke 22, 24, I love this. Uh, the, now Jesus is getting ready to uh, be crucified, getting ready, he's heartache, you know, and, and he, you know, he would be like us, and, or we would be in this situation going, what about me, right? You know, woe is me. Uh, I love the people that have the woe is me attitude. I have that at times. We all have it at times. But Jesus doesn't have the woe is me attitude. And, but this is what he has to hear. They are arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. These guys have seen the miracles. They've heard the teachings of Jesus. They've walked with Jesus for three years, and they didn't get it. My friends, there's a point there how long we've been walking with Jesus and we still don't get it. But they are talking about me, myself, and I. And so really the problem is pride. That's our problem in everything. It's pride. The problem in community is me. Now, now some people go, well, the problem in community is you, right? Yeah, that's what we always go. If some, so-and-so would leave, then things would just be so much better, right? Or if so-and-so would just get their attitude together, then things would be so much better. But you know what it tells us in the book of James? It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the battles waging within you? Don't they come from your, bat your urges? Don't they come from your feelings? So in other words, the problems that we face are not problems based upon other people because guess what? They're not going anywhere. But yet in the midst of all those things, we are called to be more than conquerors. In the midst of those things, we are called to be peaceful. We are called to be joyful and we are called to forgive. So really the issue is, it is other people's pride, but it's also my pride. Because don't we do this? I shouldn't be treated this way. I shouldn't have to deal with this. I am worth more than this and this and that. Well, this is what God's remedy is to that. Philippians 2.3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. So the world tells you, you shouldn't be treated like this. And we go, that's right. I shouldn't be treated like this, right? Isn't that what you do? Uh, bless God, I will not put up with this any longer. I'm going to tell them off. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Well, most of us can't even figure out where our minds are to get a piece of it. But... Here's the thing, you know, we, we go, I'm not putting up with it anymore. But what does the Bible call us to do? To put up with it. To shut up and to love up. To sit there and be humble and to serve them. Stop complaining about people. Stop whining about people. I'm talking to you. Okay, yeah, everybody's quiet today. Quiet in the church. They're like, we don't like this message. Bring back the other guy from last week. But anyway... But he talked about pride, didn't he? See, we are called to be humble, and that means we choose to lay down ourselves for one another. Not because they deserve it, but because God commands it. See, we have to start, stop asking ourselves how we feel about God's commands, because I don't like most of them, my feelings don't like most of them, but I love Jesus, and I love the result of it, okay? Now, how do we make community work? And my friends, this is the last slide. Everybody say amen. amen. That's the loudest amen I got all day. First one is commitment. We're not very good at commitment. This is what I tell marriages that are in trouble. If you have the exit sign on, you will find a way to justify yourself to get to that exit. If that sign is on, you're going to find a way to exit out of that. And you go, well, bless God, I don't deserve this, I don't deserve that, blah, 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 blah. 
my friends, here's the question. There is a decision that each and every one of us have to make every day. And it's a decision, are we going to do what we want to do or are we going to do things that honor God? And when we do things that honor God, it makes it real easy what the clean cut decision is. It's really clear cut there. So we have to be committed, but we're not very committed. Hebrews 10.25 tells us, let us commit ourselves to being together all the more as the day approaches. That is, all the more as problems get more difficult, that's when we dig in and we commit ourselves. We're not committed to much of anything in our society. If we don't like it, we don't have to do it. If people get on my nerves, look, there is a church on every block. And that's what some people do. They shuffle themselves from church to church to church, trying to find the perfect church. And they fail to recognize that they themselves are probably the problem. I'm just saying, you think that you're going to find the perfect church? There is no such thing as a perfect church because there are no such thing as perfect people. People will let you down. So you got to make a commitment. You got to go put the line in the sand. This day I choose, this is what I'm going to do. And when we make a decision, we got to stop asking ourselves how we feel about the decision. People always want me to go back and think about things that I've already made a decision on. You know, I have to make decisions all throughout the day for all different types of things. And I don't have time to overanalyze every decision. And people go, well, did you think about this? I mean, you would be surprised. Well, some of you wouldn't. I mean, the amount of talk and discussion that there has to go in with how this pulpit is set up. And whether or not I'm over here or I'm over here. Whether or not there's a clavin over there or this or that. And I go, really? 30,000 children die at every day, die every day of hunger and malnutrition and you want me to think about that? Don't have time for it. Make a decision and move on. We need to be decisive people. Amen? Amen. And we need to stop wishy-washy. That's why nobody gets anything done in their life because they're sitting there overthinking it as if your brain could possibly comprehend the awesomeness of God. Just saying. Okay. Now, second thing is a focus on serving and building. See, some of us come into church and we go, what are they going to do for me? What about me? I like the people that they're sick and somehow through osmosis, I'm supposed to know that they're sick. Like in the morning, God downloads into my brain, Jenny's sick. Oh, Jenny's sick. You know, people go, well, nobody came to visit me. Well, your church attendance is like two out of four every month. So how will we know you're supposed to be sick? And why didn't you call us, right? Because what's our focus? What about me? What are you going to do for me? The focus of church, let me tell you something. Church is not designed to make you feel good. It's not designed to give you goosebumps because the flu will do that. It is not designed to do all that stuff and it's not designed to serve you. It's designed so that we might serve one another. And ultimately, why are we serving one another? We're serving one another to serve Christ. And the other thing we have to start doing is using our words, building up, to build one another up. You know, I told you this before, my favorite sin is gossip. How many of you love gossip? I love gossip because it makes me feel better about me, right? If I can talk about how bad you are, then I feel better about the dysfunction in my life. Amen? Amen. I love gossip. I know that all of you are like, well, we're not listening to him anymore. Okay, but I love it. But we should be using our words at all times to build one another up. You know what the Bible tells us about how we're supposed to use our words? Praising God, thanking God, building one another up, helping, exhorting, all that stuff. What do we use our words? To judge and to tear down, and we wonder why things don't work. Vulnerability. Oh, we don't like this. This is another thing we don't like. Because, bless God, I don't want anybody to hurt me. Here's what I tell people when you come to join the church. We're going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to let you down. You're going to let me down. We're all going to hurt one another. But you know what? There is no relationship without vulnerability. That's what we learn in Genesis when God puts the tree in the garden and he gives the people a choice to obey him, gives Adam and Eve a choice to obey him or to take of the tree. What was God doing? He was allowing himself to be vulnerable. Why was he allowing himself to be vulnerable? Because there cannot be love without vulnerability. There can't be love, and God wanted us to freely choose to love him, not because we had to, but because we want to. So we have to be willing to be vulnerable and understand that people are going to hurt us and they're going to let us down. It's going to happen. And then when that happens, we have to be a peacemaker and maintainer of peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. 
for they are the children of God. My friends, that's what we're called to do. Now, being a peacemaker requires several things. Um, it doesn't require us to go home and think about whether or not we should make peace. It doesn't go home and require who's the blame, right? We like to play the blame game. Well, they did this and therefore I did that. No, no, no. Blessed are the peacemakers and the maintainers. Whose job is it to make peace? Raise your hand. Whose job is it to be the first to apologize? Raise your hand. And let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you a little secret, and some pastors won't tell you this. You don't have to feel it to say it. <laughs> right? If we would just fake it till we make it, right, and just go, I'm sorry. And don't do this, I'm sorry you feel that way. No, 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 no. But you go, I'm sorry. If you can fake it till you make it and let your feelings catch up because your brain knows, right, that's the right thing to do. I need to be sorry. And you go, but bless God, I'm not sorry. They should be sorry. Well, they may never change, but do you want to change? Do you want to be better? Then take steps to act better. And sometimes you have to act better before you feel like being better, right? Because I only feel like being better about five minutes out of the day. And the rest of the time, I'm faking it until I make it. I'm a work in progress. But so let, let's, everybody, let's practice this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those words will save your marriage, will save your families, will save your church, will save you so much peace. And you know what doesn't matter? And you know what happens to your pride? It starts going like this every time you do that. It, uh, uh, uh. And you know what happens with Jesus in your life? Gets more and more. You decrease, Christ increase. That's what happens when we start doing what he tells us to do, even if we don't feel like it. Let's understand something. It doesn't matter how you feel because you don't know how you feel. It matters what God's word says. So you, you know what the Bible says about before you even come to worship? If you know that your brother or sister has something against you, or we can even say it the other way, you have something against them. It says, lay your gift down at the altar, Jesus says, and go reconcile with them, and then come back and worship. How many of us are sitting here today with bitterness in our life? I meet so many mad Christians. They're angry at this person, angry at that person. They don't, won't go talk to this person, won't go do this. You know what? It's a lot of work to stay angry, isn't it? There are people that go, well, I'm not going to that because that person's going to be there. Well, now you just allowed them to control your life. And they don't even know they're controlling your life. You have a phantom menace in your life. So my friends, do we want God to direct our lives or do we want to direct our lives? We've been doing a pretty lousy job ourselves, amen? amen. So we are called into community to be better together through Christ so that Christ receives the glory. We are the island of misfit toys, but that's why Christ gets all the glory out of it. Because if we were all studly like me, <laughs> then the, and then the world as studly, handsome, and intelligent, and witty, and charming as me, then the world would not see the power of the gospel. But the power of the gospel comes to whosoever will. Whosoever will take the promises of God and apply them in our lives, that's the person that God's going to be able to use. Amen? Amen. Do you want to be the person God wants to use, can use? Amen? Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy girly men. You want to say that again? 
If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really?